Without their, pro without their project architect, Dr. Liao and his team seemed a bit apprehensive that the talk may not be suitable for Hong Kong ICON's members who are all trained architectural conservationists. But I assured him that they will really sit back and enjoy what he has to tell you about the temple itself. So I told him not to worry about it at all. He's in very good company and very friendly people. It was suggested that with my guidance, familiarity with Penang architecture, having been responsible for successfully restoring similar temples in Penang and Malacca, and more specifically, my role as a jury member of the UNESCO Awards, which I've been more or less there for the last 20 over years, I could fill in the gaps of information so that a well-rounded CPD can be presented to you. Without hesitation, I accepted the invitation, primarily, if I may be allowed to say, as a gesture to pay tribute to the contributions of Tan Yao Wee, who made a difference in the practice of building conservation in Penang and Malaysia, especially through his long life research on Chinese architecture and its roots in this region. I dare say there are not many practitioners who see practice and scholarly pursuit as inseparable. I would like to quickly explain the reason for the first part of the lecture's title, The Legacy of a Deity. This is because Tai Pak Kung is today one of the most prayed to deities on what I love to call the island of the gods, so named because of the temples that were so liberally scattered all over Penang Island by previous generations. A very good friend of mine, Ronnie Pitzler, a long-time cultural expert on folk religion, wrote, when you start to appreciate some of the background stories, the god statues and the paintings really come to life. With a little curiosity and a modicum of further research, it's possible to find a legend, a myth, or even a historical event associated with every square foot of the land. You have to come to Penang to witness this. Legend has it that a Hakka gentleman called Chang Li, who lived and died in Penang, was in time consecrated as a deity or minor god and a temple built to honor him and his other friends. What makes him a local deity special and unique to Penang? That's what makes him, you know, uh, special to us as well. The questions that I've tried to find logical answers to but failed is, at what point does a human being stop being a human being and become a god? And when does reality become a myth? But I'm getting ahead of myself. Allow me now to invite our main speaker, Dr. Liao, to first tell us how he came to be involved in this project and then to tell his story about the origins of the temple, its history, its legacy. I'm pretty sure you're going to enjoy the tale. Dr. Liao, could I invite you to start the talk ball rolling? Thank you. Thank you, Lavina, and thank you, Professor Lawrence. Good evening, everybody. Yeah, so I think this is my turn now to actually come into this, which I'm very nervous. Because as Professor has actually told just now, yeah, this is talking to Hong Kong icon. So that was the first thing which is like, oh, professionals. And these are the, all the experts. They are much better than me. So, but anyway, I think we are taking up this role because we actually want to enhance our Tai Pak Kong Temple because we won the award and we want everybody to know how we actually win it. And we are sharing our experience. So this is more like an experience sharing. So if there were to be any mistakes, of course, it's mine. But Professor Lawrence's uh, guidance is definitely very, very helpful in me preparing this uh, slides of presentation later, which you are going to see. So I have to really say a very big thank you to him. Yeah, but for his encouragement, I really will feel very, very nervous. But at least now I have something I think we can share and hopefully this won't disappoint you. And then let's go on with the talk. And then uh, this is the the award-winning temple, yeah, you can see from the thing. Right, so next, please. 
Lavina? Yeah. So this is the one from the UNESCO. This is how the recital of the of the award winning, the UNESCO Award of Merit. We did not get the Excellence Award, but we got the Award of Merit on the UNESCO Awards, Asia Pacific Awards for Cultural Heritage Conservation. So we only get the Award of Merit, but that is good enough for us, I think, because being a very small temple, about 7,000 square feet, so less than 7,000 square feet. So we are able to, to spend 3 million ringgit, Malaysian ringgit. So this is what we can actually achieve, I think, but for Tan Yao Wei, you wouldn't be able to achieve this one. Next, please. So talking about how I actually became into this, came into this picture of this restoration project. So I was elected chairman of the temple in 2014. So when 2014, we started the project. So it was because due to the roof and water leakage problem, we have that at the King Street Temple, the project temple. So later, I'll actually explain the, the history of the temple. But meanwhile, you just understand that this temple itself, we were facing the leaking and the water leaking problem. And then at that point of time, knowing that our uh, uh, building is actually under a category one heritage building in the Georgetown, which is a, a UNESCO World Heritage Site. <clears throat> Therefore, we actually had to look for experts to actually to see whether we can do this repair or that restoration work. So when we want to look for the restoration work, the repair work, so immediately I was thinking of Tan Yao Wei because he was the one who actually, I knew him was actually knowing that he, he was doing the Han Chiang Ancestral Temple and he got an award, a UNESCO award. I think he, he was a major pay, player in the role. He played a major role in winning that award. So we were quite happy to actually get him. So, but when we talked to him, so the first thing first was he actually said that because I mean, he was also quite famous for his nastiness, if I may say so. Yeah, so because he's always requires for the strictest and the highest standard, he wants the all compliance. So it's always difficult. He has quarrels with contractors, he has quarrels with suppliers, he has quarrels with everybody, the local councils, and then he he been chased away in my temple. In fact, before he passed away, I think that was last year or a year before. So he came to my temple and then he was being chased away by someone from the neighbor because they were doing the repair and then he went and complained, hey, you did the wrong thing. He was doing that. He was that kind of character. So when we actually started dealing with him, we were actually saying that, look, it will be difficult to deal with him and then you will be seeing all the expectation will be very high. So, but to get that, you must actually, uh, uh, only with that kind of standard, we are expecting that because, I mean, you are talking about UNESCO award. So with that, we are actually looking into the issues as to how we can do that. So first thing first, I asked him, what is the temple like? And then he was saying that, yes, this is a good temple. It has a very high cultural and heritage value. So it's definitely worth our effort to actually to, to aim for the, the highest standard. So if possible, if we do not only a repair work, because that was repairing on the roof, but if only we can do the restoration. Because when we asked for the quotation for the repair, he was saying that, look, it will about it will be costing 900,000 ringgit, 800 to 900,000 ringgit. But to repair the whole temple, to restore the whole temple, it will cost about 1.5 million ringgit. That was his quotation then. So I was thinking, yeah, 6,000, 600,000 is different, so I might as well go for the whole temple. So he was actually saying that if you go for the whole temple, you may be able to achieve the, the we can go for the national heritage, we can go for the UNESCO heritage. So these are the awards we were actually aiming at. So that point of time we were thinking so he but one thing he actually warned me he said that if you were to employ me appoint me to be a consultant then you will be expected to actually the costing will actually be be increased as compared to the ordinary repair so that is how we actually started so when we have the repair itself then that is uh that, then he said the cost is the issues then i said never mind as long as you can actually promise me you can get a unesco award he did not guarantee but he was saying that, yes, we have a very, very high chance because, I mean, the temple itself has that kind of structure and then the skeleton, the building structure and everything. It all has the, the criteria. We can actually fulfill the criteria of a, a UNESCO award. So with that itself, we proceeded. And the rest is history now. So this is how I actually got involved in the first place. So, and next, please. Lavina. Yeah, so this is Mr. Tan Yao Wei. The late Mr. Tan Yao Wei. So you can see that this is the photo from the Salam Takzir. It's actually a condolence note 
in Malay. So you can see that this is from the Malaysia National Heritage Department. They actually sent a condolence note to Mr. Tanya Wei. So you can see his uh, reputation as well as his uh, value in this uh, National Heritage Department. They actually sent him this one. So conservation pioneer. And for this project, I really have to say that I actually dedicated the award during the award-winning ceremony to this to, to Mr. Tanya Wei. Because I think without him, we wouldn't be able to. As a lawyer, I'm not actually familiar with this consultant or, or architect at all. So the conservation that's actually new to me. It was only when I actually went into this project. So he was the one who was guiding me. He was teaching, he was supervising, he was managing. So he was basically leading the whole project. So we really had to dedicate this award to him. But for his effort, we wouldn't be able to achieve what we achieved today. Yeah. So this one, I really have to actually record our sincere condolences and great appreciation on the late Mr. Tanya Wee. Next, please. So, and for this project, so we go back to the project itself. So in terms of the project, we actually want the project deal based on the three things. Yeah, first is actually understanding the pace and its significance. So the second is the technical achievement and the sustainability and impact. So these are the criteria which we actually want the award. So, and on this part, I'm actually talking about the understanding of the place. These are the, the, the three subheadings which are going towards later. So, understanding the place and the significance. So, we'll talk about the history. So, afterwards, we have the honor to actually invite Professor Lawrence to talk about the technical achievement. So, this part, I learned a bit from Mr. Tan Yao Wei. Yeah, I learned quite a bit from Yao Wei when he was doing it because when he was doing the project, I went there and then I learned from him. I can do some some talking as well, but I think we have the honor. So we are so great that actually Professor Lawrence is willing to explain to us on this thing. So with his expertise, I think it will be very much benefited. Then after that, we'll talk about sustain sustainability and impact. This is because we actually have to be able to be sustained. In order to win the UNESCO award, we must have this sustainability and impact because eventually this will help us to actually, I think that's one word which is very important is the OUV, Outstanding Universal Value. So this temple itself is actually the illustration of how we actually can enhance the heritage site of Georgetown. So this project itself has the Outstanding Universal Value that actually creates the, the enhanced the UNESCO heritage site of Georgetown. So this, we will talk about that later. So next, please. So the first, we talk about the history. So understanding the place and its significance. Next, please. So let's talk about the glossary first. I think we do some understanding here because just for easy ex explanation later. So this is our actually the, the full name of the temple. So is actually Sea Pearl Island, literary translation. Yeah. is the pinyin. So in terms of the in, in Hokkien, because in Penang, we are full of Hokkien speaking uh, people here. So it, it's always called Hai Chu Su. So sometimes you tell people about Hai Chu Yi, they may not know, but you tell them Hai Chu Su. Then they'll know, oh, oh, that temple near the beach or the one Hai Chu Su. Yeah, because it's near the beach. That is the original temple, the main temple. So then we have this Tai Pak Kong. So our temple name is actually Tai Pak Kong Eng Sok Temple. Tai Pak Kong is actually means great uncle, Ta Po Kong. Yeah, in Han Yiping, it's Ta Po Kong. Then in Fujian Mingnan, it's actually Tua Pe Kong. So in Penang, you always see people praying Tua Pe Kong. I go and pray Tua Pe Kong, Tua Pe Kong. So people don't uh, seldom talk about Tai Pak Kong because they know Tua Pe Kong more than Tai Pak Kong because uh, Tua Pe Kong is the, is the, is the, uh, the common dialect in Penang. Then Tai Pak Kong. I think if Cantonese in, in, in Hong Kong, you definitely know Tai Pak Kong. This is Tai Pak Kong. Yeah, so Xiang Huo. So the Xiang Huo will be the one which I'm going to talk about later on the several temples because this is where we talk about the Xiang Huo. It's actually the flames and light. Literal translation is flames and light of burning joysticks and candles. Yeah, but in actual fact, it actually means the culture, the heritage, and the value of a Xiang Huo of a temple, of the of the praying. So this is Xiang Huo, the flames and light. Yeah. So we will actually get the Xiang Huo afterwards. I'll explain later. Next, please. So Wu Su Eng Sok. Eng Sok is actually the place where we, because I mean the temple is actually originated, uh, managed by the five districts, Huizhou, Jiaying, Da Pu, Zhenglong, and Yongding. So these are from the Guangdong as well as the Fujian province. So 
and this one later I'll, I'll show you the, the map. Then Tai Pak Kong is also known as the Fu De Zheng Sheng. So sometimes you see that even our, our temple here, you can see that it's actually called Fu De Zhi because Fu De Zhi is actually like a god of prosperity. Fu De Zheng Sheng is god of prosperity or virtue. So this is uh, the other name of Tai Pak Kong. Then there's also the Tao Te Kong. This is uh, in, in, uh, in Hokkien. So Tao Te Kong, so this is the earth god. So this is like the local, yeah, the, the local god. So this is quite common. The name are actually quite common in Malaysia and Singapore. So you can see that our temple also has a Fu De in on top of it. So Fu De is also talking about Fu De Zheng Sheng. Yeah, so this is how we actually derive the, the names. Then next. <clears throat> so this is Eng Sok, the map of Eng Sok from China. So I think those in Hong Kong, you can see Hong Kong is here. Yeah, Hong Kong icon people, you can see Hong Kong is here. I'm sure you are more familiar than me. I've been to Huizhou only of the, of, the, of the five places. Huizhou I've been to there quite a few times. I think it's only one hour from Shenzhen, right? Yeah, Hong Kong people, right? <laughs> so, and then the Zhenglong, Zheng, uh, Huizhou, Jiaying, Da, Puyong, I think these are all the five districts. So this is where all the management uh, associations are from. So next. So Wu Fang Fu Lao, this is one of the flag which we have in the temple itself. This Wu Fang, I think it actually says about the five districts. So when it was actually in 1813, we already have this. So it can be seen that since 1813, because the temple was built in 1810. So in 1813, there was actually the, the, the flag which was actually sent to them. So I think this is actually talking about the Wu Fang Fu Lao, means the five elderly pioneers from the five districts. Right, next. So this part will be the one where I think I wouldn't actually talk too much because I mean, just now Professor Lawrence has already touched on it. So basically the origin of Tai Pak Kong worship is actually, we have this deification. Yeah, so it's actually from the human being is elevated to God stature. So with that itself, we have the history. The legend actually says that in time before uh, Francis Sight came in 1876. So around 1840, year 1840, the three of them were already in, in Penang. So the, there was the name Zhang Li, Chia, Chiu Zhang Fu, and Ma Fu Chun. So these are the three. And then Zhang Li is the one which we are now praying as the Tai Pak Kong. So he is the Tai Pak Kong, which is actually elevated from human being to God stature. So the deification. So this is the, sorry. So this is the part you can see the three graves. So that's, that was originally when they came in 1840s, they were there and then they were helping. I think they're helping the locals, they were doing charities, all the good deeds. So eventually people that were paying them and call them as great uncles. Yeah. So that was Tai Pak Kong because they are Hakka. So they were actually called and then their graves are all there. So the temple was actually next to the graves. So you can see at the back of this, yeah. So this part, you can see at the back of this part, uh, all of the people there, the, the, left, the, the middle part, that is the temple. So that is the original, the first temple in, in Penang to, to pray the Tai Pak Kong. So uh, this is the grave, yeah, yeah the, the grave. So you can see the tombstone there, the three tombstones for the, for the three uh, Swan brothers. Next. So this is how the Tai Pak Kong actually started the origin of the, the praying. So next we talk about the Tai Pak Kong temples. So you can see the sustainability and the impact of this Tai Pak Kung temple because we can see that from 1799, our story actually says that 1799, we have the Tai Pak Kung temple started in. So this is, you can see the right, the right hand side is the temple, which is near the seaside, the beach. This is where we claim that all the, uh, the people from China, when they came, the first Chinese coming over from China, from the Southern China, they came and then they were stepping on this part where it's actually near the beach. So they have the beach and then they actually were praying because Tai Pak Kong was actually in 18, some, 17 something, they were already there. And at, since 1799, we already started the prayer. So, but I actually had a question mark on 1792 because we are actually thinking that we could actually, we have one uh, incense urn in the temple, in this temple itself, a stone incense urn, which actually says about Qianlong Ren Long which is 1792. So that is actually a proof that we have that that is one of the first artifact, yeah, uh, in in the in in this region actually in, in in Penang Island. One of the first is actually recorded. 
So this is the, the record that we actually have in 1792. And later there's actually another temple from Malacca. They claim to actually start in 1795, but they were actually saying that they get their fame and the ashes, which is their Xiang Po, yeah, their, their culture from the Penang Temple. So next we actually have about the 1810. So this is, sorry. So the 1810 is, no, go back, sorry. Yeah, 1810 is actually the temple, which is actually a word meaning temple. So this is the one built in 1810. So this temple actually came because there were the time, the seaside is actually a bit far away, about six, seven kilometers away. So I think that point of time, 1810, the, that 1810 temple, the Taipa Kong King Street temple is near the Georgetown. So I think that is to facilitate and to, for the convenience of the, uh, the business circle, the business community. Therefore, they actually have this uh, temple built to actually so that to, to ease their prayer ceremony. So next, please. So you can see that the next one is actually, this is how we actually got, no, there should be one more, sorry. Okay. So, no, this is okay. Never mind. So this one, we actually have this temple. So this one is from Kedah. We have another temple in Kedah, 1862. Then we have one temple in Para, 1872. Then this Malacca one is 1795. These are all the temples claiming to get their ashes, which is their Xiang Huo from the Taipakong Temple in Penang, our temple. Next, please. So this is the Taipakong Temple, the, the one, the King Street Temple, which is the branch temple sprouting from the Tanjong Tokong Taipakong Temple. And this is the second oldest Chinese temple in Georgetown. It was built in 1810. Next. So 1865, that was the first original single block building extended with a courtyard and a second hall. Then in 1880s, it was further extended with two side wings. So now we actually have a building with three wings. So in 1911 and 12, this is the major restoration and elaborated envelope with complicated internal space. So in this time, our architect design is actually based on this, this period. Because we did not go back to the 1810, we did not have the picture and all that. But 1911, I think we are following that kind of, uh, that, that period, the eras, uh, architectural design and the, the style. So this is, so the temple now will look like what we were actually be 100 years ago. Right, next. So I think this part, we actually have to lead, uh, pass it and then we have the honor to invite our Professor Lawrence to talk about the technical achievement. Professor Lawrence? You Thank you, Dr. Liao. Hi. Um, I think the second pillar in the UNESCO Awards is technical achievement. And in fact, within that category, we actually have four uh, criteria. The first one is how well the project addresses the technical issues of conservation and restoration. The second one is about application of appropriate building artisans and conservation techniques, including traditional building practices. The third criteria is about application of appropriate materials. And the fourth is how well any added elements or technical solutions respect and or enhance the significance of place. And if I refer back to the citation, it, uh, it elaborates on how it's the technical achievement of the of the conservation work that actually uh, compelled all the judges to look at the merit of the project, right? And when you get an award of merit, it, what it's really saying is that they have done and answered all the criteria well. So it is a very, very large achievement. Can I go to the next slide? So this was just uh, the signboard that went, went up and was there for five years. Next one. This was, in fact, uh, a, pa a painting, you know, a painting of what they expected it to look like at the end of the conservation. And so if you, you have this image in mind and you eventually look at the final product, did they achieve this effect? That would be the question. Next. So we always talk about uh, in conservation, we always talk about top down, right? And very clearly when we re restore uh, all the temples, whether it's whatever part of the country it is, 
we actually erect a temporary roof over the temple. And this has become, in fact, uh, forced the regular in almost every conservation project to do. And so if you're talking about top down, we start with the roof and we start with the restoration. And here, uh, what you see is what we call the Chen Nian or what is called the cut and paste porcelain fresco or shard work. When they take these bowls, you can see in the front of the uh, slide, both orange, green, and red bowls. And they actually cut it into small shards and they put together the images within the fresco itself. So it's a three-dimensional fresco, right? You can see it's a, uh, what they do is you can see the man, he has produced a very small uh, plaster figurine as a base. And then he, he puts the porcelain piece by piece onto that plaster figurine in order to give a very more realistic image of a human being. And it's a very tedious job. All right, next one. So here is another uh, photograph of how they're restoring the roof. And the amazing part is that when I had worked with craftsmen of these experts, I remember when I first did another building, all the Chen Nian had in fact disappeared. And so like a typical architect, I asked the artisan, you have to give me a drawing before we can allow you to start. I remember saying that in the year 2000. And he said, I don't need a drawing. It's all very traditional. It's, it's something that we learn, you know, uh, by working on a building. And so in the end, when I actually let them loose, they actually could replicate and they knew exactly which flower to put in what place. So if you look at the very elaborate uh, three-dimensional fresco, I wouldn't have guessed one would be, have been a chrysanthemum, the other one would have been a peony, but they knew. Because I think in terms of tradition, the idea of tradition and the vernacular is that it's something that is passed down through oral history and through uh, working hand in hand with more senior people and the memory of what is there remains engraved in the mind. Next. That's Mr. Tan Yaoi, you know, walking around uh, at the top. So it's a combination of both uh, painting onto wet plaster and as well as uh, putting on the, the cut and paste shard work using the ceramic bowls. Next. Again, uh, top down. In the process, we would, well, the first thing that we start with is the roof, right? So we would, that they would take out all the roof tiles and they re-examine all the purlins and they will start replacing the purlins and then they will do this uh, yin-yang sort of tiling uh, system that goes all the way and follows this curve down to the roof below. Next. This is uh, them putting up the roof trusses. And one, one very interesting thing that uh, we started to do in, in Malaysia, I, I'm not sure whether they do it in China, but we found that when we examined the, the, the circular uh, beams in the Chinese temples, it was always the ends that were rotten, that were suffering from wet rot. Or from, and then when it gets wet, the termites start to eat the ends. And so every single place we went to, we found the ants always rotting, you know? And that's where all the dampness would come into the beams. So we actually, this was, we did this in the Cheng Kun Teng in uh, Malacca and Yao Wei worked with me there. And I think we just said, maybe we should wrap the ants with some metal part like this brass and just give it a bit more protection from the dampness and maybe the the beam will last a bit longer. And that's what you see here being done, right? So it's, it's been some a practice which just continues. And if I didn't tell you about it, uh, 50 years from now, somebody opens up and they, they can't remember who did it. So that's the important part about conservation, the de documentation. Next. Here we are putting on the roof tiles 
and doing a very nice lime mortar mix. But little is known about the mixture of the mortar because what, what I've learned is that when they mix the lime mortar, they actually add to it um, very, very soft tissue, right? And they, they'll, they'll soak the tissue and they'll mash the, the rice paper tissue and then they'll mix it in, into the lime mortar as, as a binder. And therefore, uh, it's a technique which, unless you are following the craftsman and seeing how they mix it, you would not uh, really understand what, what the, you know, the rice paper, tons of rice paper they have on the side is used for. But this is them sort of putting it into place the roof tiles on top of the lime mortar and on top of the purlins. Next. Here's a gable end, and this is really a, what we call a chai hoi. Chai hoi just really means fresco. And the, the, the paint that they use is actually tempura, which is tempura, which is really also a very, very traditional Italian technique where they'll actually mix uh, egg white into the paints and apply it into the painting. And after this is finished, they will put a layer of linseed oil over the paint in order to preserve the, the color and make it uh, last a bit longer in the tropical sun. And this is the gentleman doing the chai hui. And it's the same gentleman who also does the chen nian or the ceramic cut and paste. It's uh, any one of the key artisans that come to site, and they, these are all uh, experts from China. They are very good at the complete uh, range of works for the, for the temple. They can do the woodwork, they can do the plastering, they can do the carvings, they can do the polishing, they can do the finishing, you know? And so it's, they are able to multitask and that's the difference in uh, the traditional approach as opposed to the modern approach. Next. Here they are doing really traditional Western uh, sort of uh, plastering and motif work, right? And I guess in Penang, what, what you will see is actually a very eclectic approach to architecture. There's a strong, even here in the Chinese temple, which when you look at it, the form is... Definitely very, it's a very Hokkien form. But nonetheless, you'll see all this uh, very classical Western architectural motifs being installed as well. And that, that is really what Penang is about. The, the marriage of the East and West. Here is, they are using lacquering, but the lacquer is actually uh, the resin from a special tree found in China. And what they do is they collect the sap, uh, it hardens. They will, traditionally, they will have it in very big uh, urns, ceramic urns, and they'll bring them over. And I remember when I first worked on the Chiang Fatsi Mansion, they actually had these big urns. And what they did is they would pour these very, 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 very thick oils, which are not very pure. And then they'll put it into a pot and they'll cook it. And the amazing part is uh, for when they are cooking this uh, lacquer, it is very, very, very toxic. And people who are not used to it, when they walk past it, they actually get rashes. Right? I remember my wife walking past them doing this when they're cooking it and they had rashes. And, but because it's so powerful as a, as a material, eventually when it sets, you know, it's really hard and it's really durable. And this man who has been putting on the lacquer has to do seven layers, right? And each layer, he'll have to let it dry for two weeks. So this is not anybody's favorite method of uh, treating timber today. But it's actually very dark in nature, right? looking very much like a dark oil. And where, what you see here is they actually add to it a bit of linseed oil to dilute it, plus some uh, dye. And very often they put a red dye, so when you look at the finish, it has this very deep liver purple uh, effect. 
And after they put in the seven layers, you can see this beautiful shine, which is what lacquer itself is, right? Next. So that's lacquer work. They apply it also the beam. And they, they had this technique of uh, expressing the different colors. So here you can see the circular beams being painted in much darker color, right? But with the carvings, uh, which are part of the support decoration within the hall, this is all proper gold leaf work. You know, it's not gold paint, but it's actually gold leaf. Next. And obviously the plastering. The plastering is a traditional uh, lime water plaster, but uh, mixed in proportions that the Chinese artisans uh, practice. Slightly different mix. And they actually use a lot of what we call lime putty. They, they favor lime putty and wet putty rather than dry, you no know, lime. Next. Here, they're putting the finishing touches around the plaque, replastering it. Next. And again, and then at the front of the building on the vertical walls, there are these carved granite windows, right? So what you see the gentleman painting over is they're actually painting over granite carving, which is normally gray. So sometimes when you look at these temples, you, you notice that the color is very rich, very raw, and very bright, right? And if, if you look at traditional fre frescoes restoration in, say, Italy, or on Europe, in Europe, they are very uh, muted, they are very faded. And so the, there's always this debate, right? How do you do restoration in a Chinese temple? But if you talk to the artisans, they say, you know, we have been doing this renewal forever and ever, all, the, all, the, all the, through the different generations, and you don't see anything wrong with it. So it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a taste that you would have to get used to, right? If you look at new restored Chinese temples, you think that in the European tradition, they would be very muted and very the patina age would be there. But when you look at the finished product here, you, you see that the patina of age is not there. So again, different cultures have different approaches to conservation, and you would really have to follow the whole tradition as they restore the temples to understand that there is a very specific uh, approach between the East and the West. Next. And a very nice thing that happened while they're restoring it and lifting up the old uh, floor tiles, they actually discovered several wells in the side wings. And these would have been there right from day one when the original temple was built. But as we have found in many of these buildings, uh, when the well doesn't become useful, they tend to just fill it in and close it up. It's a very nice gesture that they have really restored the well as well. As you can see, the next slide. Huh? I don't know whether they are actually using the water <laughs> for consumption, but it's nice to have. A no, not now. Con it's quite now I'm, sh I'm, I'm sure. It's clear, but it's, I think we, we dare not drink. It's clear. Yes. You, can, yeah. you can see the bottom of it. Okay, that's good. Uh, okay, this is uh, another view. Quite, quite quick. And then, and then the completion, right? So here are a few before and after shots, which we'll share with you. Next. Next. So the, the temple as found before the restoration, you'll notice that the, the roof tiles were of a different color. And I can explain why. Although the... the original roof was also used using traditional tiles. Modern paints came into the picture. And I think in the last 15 years, the paint companies have actually invented what we call tile paint. So when you, when you do not want to retile your building, but want to make it look new, you actually purchase 
special formula paints that are for painting over tiles, right? Quite horrible if you think about it. So anyway, as was explained, they stripped it all off, and you can see in the earlier photographs, and they replaced it with a traditional way of uh, re-roofing uh, a Chinese building. So the after is the one below. The before and after of the exterior, right? Um, they, they, they stripped off. Next, no, no, go next, right? That's the night view. And in all the temples in Penang, on the front door or the main door, they will actually paint what they call the four guardians, right? Uh, there's a story about why they're painted on the doors, you know, but it'll take me too long to tell you the story. But suffice to say, if you do go to Penang and you look at all the uh, main doors of temples, when it's closed, you will see the, the guardians painted on them. And so this was a painting that was refreshed. Next. Inside, obviously, there was restoration and <clears throat> You would strip off the paints and go back to the original layers, and you find that the original layers was simple white uh, lime, lime wash, right? And so there was work done to restore the, the furniture in this case. Next. Keeping the spirit of the building and keeping the original color of the building, you can see that, that over time people would have done their own interpretations of what the Chinese temple color would look like. But here they reverted to the, basically it's, it would more, be more off-white. It's actually uh, raw lime with water and with a bit of binder thrown in next. The roof. See, what happens in uh, a lot of the Chinese temples over time after the, after the artisans had finished with it. And you have to understand that we had to bring in the Chinese artisans from China because the local uh, artisans had already lost the art of applying what I call the hachi or the big oils, the lacquering, and they would have replaced it with uh, Western paints, right? The gloss Western paints. And at one stage, everybody thought uh, we should put this bright red because bright Red signifies prosperity and, you know, and obviously the joy of the, expressing the joy of building. So it became very common to come to a, a newly painted temple in the 50s and the 60s, 1960s, and you find it all in red, bright red. So again, with the artisan's input, they tell you exactly what the original should be. And it's really a more muted brownish, lacquer finish, as you can see. Next. The, the main altar before and after, not, not much restoration needed, just cleaning up and uh, repointing the gold leaf. Next. Next. Well, obviously, over time, you know, people, people uh, will look they will redesign their own domestic quarters. They'll put in like grill doors, you know, for safety, etc. But here's where they very, very deliberately reverted back to the original form, as you can see. And you can appreciate, right, the quality of the finishes and the, the material materials that are used from China right down to Asia and Malaysia. Next. Picture the roof, and very often this is actually the, the two side wings. And very often they would have put in a modern ceiling, right? This would have been a modern fiberglass ceiling, and they would have recessed uh, tube lighting and nothing of the spirit of the architecture. So when they came in, they literally reverted back to the original design, which has also the vented. Uh, jack roof, as you can see, the light coming in through, by the top, and put in some modern, modern conveniences like the ceiling lamps, right? So technically, these were fairly sympathetic to the form. Yeah. Next. The, the exterior, again, through uh, color swatches and 
peeling back to the original layers, they found that it was really white with a bit of uh, lime blue mixed into it. And a, a lot of the architecture from southern China, especially Fujian province, they would have used these uh, red bricks to clad the columns and the walls, as you can see um, where the arches are. Next. Well, if you look at the roof, you can see, you can literally uh, understand what I meant that it, it, was, it got a paint job over it, right? Everything is monotonous. That uh, there's no there's no uh, different shades within the, the the color of the terracotta tiles. And then you look at the final product. It's really brought the, the roof to life, and that's the way it should be. So I think I've said enough. I'll now hand this back to Dato Liu to talk about, which is the more important part as well, is about sustainability and impact, the third pillar, but which is more and more becoming the most important pillar within uh, the consideration for the awards, as well as for conservation itself. Dato Liu, please. Next, please. Uh, thank you, Professor Lawrence. Yeah, just now I was actually learning and then I was too indulged into your, your lecture already. <laughs> Even though I understand those things, but the way you present it was so, so thorough. Yeah, so I actually learned a lot. So I was like, I, I'm still, still thinking about your things. So I, I, I need some time to actually come back to myself. <laughs> Sorry, thank you. So, okay, now we talk about this sustainability. And in terms of getting the sustainability and the impact, what we were actually doing was actually, I think the UNESCO was actually, one of the criteria was that they will actually check your project after it's like completed one year. So what have you done and how to show that you are actually sustainable? It's actually during all this project, it was actually sustainable. So I think we have this, uh, <clears throat> the, the temple, the project itself, we already have the annual events. So we have the annual festivals. We have quite a few projects which we are actually getting on. So I'll just explain a bit of here. So on the annual festivals. So next, please. So annual festivals, we have the, normally we have three. So first is actually the Thai Park Kong birthday celebration. Then we also have another one, which is a Kwan Kong. I think it's Kwan Ti. Uh, so Kwan Kong is from the, time of the three kingdom. So he's also one of the, the Wu, Wu, Wu Sen. Uh, so this is the Kwan Kong. We also have the celebration of Kwan Kong in, the, in this temple. And then in Zhong Yuan Jie, we have another one, which is Zhong Yuan Jie. So first we talk about the Tai Pak Kong uh, birthday celebration. So Tai Pak Kong birthday celebration for us is actually quite a grand one. It's falling on the Lunar month, the Nong Li, yeah, the 14th day of the second lunar month. We started this. So in fact, yesterday, that was last night, we actually went and do these things again. Yeah, this is the ceremony. We went back to the temple in the in the near, near the beach, the Tanjong Tukong temple, the main temple. We were actually cleaning the, the ashes from the urn, the incense urn. So we were actually cleaning it, filtering it, and then put it back again. So this is what was actually happening last night. In fact, th today is, so we are going on the second day next. So today is what I was actually doing this, this morning again. So this is what we are actually doing. And this morning we have this. So we have the possession of the Thai Pak Kong. We have the statue of the Thai Pak Kong. We have it from the King Street Temple. And then we are actually sending it back to the, uh, uh, sending it back to the, Tanjong Tukong Temple, the main temple. So this is a procession for Thai Pak Kong. So we actually send him back the statue we actually get from the, the altar and then come back and then, so next. So this is how we actually, so this, this was actually what, what was happening this morning as well. Yeah, this is because today is the 15th day of the second lunar month. So this is what was happening. So this morning we were actually going through this one and then we had this procession and then on the way back, we have a few properties. So we will use that road yeah, the road thing is actually based on the property of the Thai Pak Kong. So which we have, I think it was actually donated by our ancestors. So we have three properties and then we have to go through that road from the road walk to the other Burma road, 
then from there Abu City Lane, and then he from there go back to Tanjung.com. So it's like as if he's actually checking through his properties. Next. Then when we go back to the temple, back to the <coughs> Tanjung Tokong main temple, then we will send the Taipa Kong statue back to where his seat is in the in the temple there. So the throughout the year it was actually empty. That's it. Only when it's actually during these few days, on the 15th, we will send back, then 17th, he will go back to the King Street Temple. So he will be there for two nights. It's like a bungalow stay for him. Next. Then this is on the next day. So the, the actual day itself. So that will be tomorrow. So tomorrow we are going to have this one, but this year we due to the pandemic. So we are not going to be so, so big event. So we won't have the, the opera. We, won't, we will have still have the Chinese uh, lion dance, but we won't have the opera. So this is on the day itself. In fact, when we have this, it was actually quite great. We have all the, the, the pig and then the roasted pig, the, the fresh pig, as well as the, the goat as well. So this is actually quite a big event, but we, we won't do it this year. Next. So on the day after tomorrow, so on the 17th, so after all the celebrations, we'll send the Thai Park Kong back to the King Street. So this is where the, the celebration stops. So it has a four days celebration. So every year, this will actually continue. So these are actually attended by all the Ng Soks uh, participants, uh, Ng Soks members, so, and also from outsiders. So if you can see all the ashes, today is actually, you can see all the incense and the joysticks. There are actually so many. Next. So this is another event we, we should have. So the birthday anniversary of Kwan Gong. So this is on the 24th day of uh, six lunar month. So it's actually celebrated. It's actually uh, celebrated in the same manner as the Thai Pak Kong's uh, celebration, except that it's only one day. Next. So after that, before this one, actually, uh, we still have the annual event, which is the, the other one is Zhong Lian Jie. So this is the Hungry Goats Festival. We also pray for that one. So that's another one which we are actually praying. Then on top of that, all the Ng Soks, during the Chinese New Year, we have four associations from the five associations from the Ng Sok, Yeah, Four out of five will have something from during the Chinese New Year, the first 15 days. So on the 6th, on the 9th, on the 11th, on the 12th, I think we have four associations will actually go back to the Tai Pak Kong Temple to actually do their prayers for each individual associations, the Ng Sok. So, then the other one, Chia Ying, will actually be doing it on the ninth day of the ninth lunar month. Yeah, the Chong Yang Jie, I think that is during the time when they were actually doing this. So the five uh, associations, the five Ng Sok will always be doing the thing during the, uh, the they will have their annual, annual praying ceremony as well. So that was the annual festivals. So to show our sustainability, so this is also one of the things which we were actually doing. During the period from the 2015, 2017, we started the, the actual building work. The physical building work was started in April, around April 2017, and ended about 2019 December. So during that period, we were actually uh, sending the Tai Pak Kong statue back to the Tanjong Tokong. So when we completed, then on the 13th of the January 2020, we send the Thai Pak Kong stand, uh, statue back to the, the new house, the renovated new house, yeah, the, the temple. So this is the ceremony. Next. So this is where uh, this is what we were doing. So we have this uh, reconsecration. Uh, send, uh, <clears throat> welcome the Thai Pak Kong back to the, the temple. Next. So this is the, the ceremony as you get the statue from the, the Tai Pak Kong back from the Tanjong Tokong Temple. This is the Tanjong Tokong Temple. Next. So this is the ceremony. Next. So we have a monk to actually help us to do all this process, the, the ceremony. Next. Next. Yeah. So this is the celebration, the, 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 the ceremony itself. Next. So yeah, this is when we actually have the uh, Thai Pak Kong back to the temple. Then from there, we start to use back the temple. So it was actually, stop we stopped for 32 months. We did not allow people to come and the devotees to come and pray. So the whole process, the actual physical work were actually carrying out for around 32 months. 
So after the 32 months, after the January, we come back and then we started that. Uh, the praying, uh, we, we get back to the back to the normal operation. Next. So in order to get this, because when we started the project, we were actually having about 500,000 ringgit Malaysia, but we need a, a budget of 3 million ringgit. So we did not have enough funds. So we were actually quite daring. We were proceeding with the project and as and when we were doing the project, we were actually raising funds. So of course, this is sort of like public-private initiative because it's all started by our temple, but we actually get the state government to involve. So we get the state government to donate to us, uh, to, to sponsor us. They, they give us a grant of uh, two chief ministers of Penang actually give 200 each. So we have 400,000 from the state government. Then the rest are all from donations and then from other Chinese associations as well. We have one Guangting. In fact, after we completed the project, even until today, we are still short of about around 500,000 now, which we are very lucky to have one Guangdong and Ting Chao Association to actually donate it to us now. We, it's actually like our mother association, parental uh, association. So we managed to get the, the <clears throat> sponsorship from them. So to only next month, we are able to get the 500,000. So this is like we are completing only the, the donation fundraising. So, but during that point of time in 2020, we were actually celebrating based on our 19, 1799. So we have a full completion of the 220 years celebration. And then at that point of time, we have this fundraising dinner. So we have the two together. So this is how we actually do it. And then this celebration was one of the biggest event for the last two years, because we have 140 tables, 42 tables, and then we have uh, around 1,400 participants, guests in the, in the event itself, which after that, because it's 2020, uh, February 29. So after that, on the 18th of March, we have the MCO, the moving control order. So there is no longer any allowed, uh, no longer any event allowed. And until now, I don't think there's any bigger event as compared to ours. So we had the last biggest event in Penang. Next. So this is our, our, our photo for the celebration. So these are the two temples. The right-hand one is our temple in Tanjong Tokong, the, the seaside temple. Then this is the town center, the King Street Temple. This is the project where we actually got. This were, the paintings were actually done before the renovation. So it was still in that color. Next. So this is the 1,400 participants in this event. Yeah, we have the Chinese Consul General to come and attend to us. And then Chief Minister was supposed to be there, but then there was an election crisis then. So they actually stopped and did not come. So, but anyway, this is actually one of the biggest events or, or the largest event, in fact, for the last two years. Because after that, I don't think that we actually allowed to do that. So this is our media publicity. So we have the full page, color page of the, uh, the, from, from the newspapers. So this is when we started. Then the next. This is the report of uh, during that dinner itself, we raised about 1.4 million ringgit. Yeah, so this is our, our reporting on the on the project or on the fundraising dinner. So we managed to raise 1.4 million. Next. So in order to do this also, we are actually because the of the cultural heritage value, we actually have to do this in order to actually. <coughs> uh, so we actually publish a book. So this book actually we have the ecstasy, uh, aesthetic value of our temple. We have the details, some fine details of our temple, the beauty of our temple. And then we also recorded the ceremony, the Tai Pak Kong birthday celebration. So just now the pictures were all from this book. So this is the book which is actually going on. It was published in 2015, I think. Yeah, yeah. so this is the book, the front cover. This is the Tai Pak Kong temple at the Tanjong Tokong. Next, this is the back. This is the second temple. In, this is the, the subject temple with the award-winning temple. Next. So this is, oh, this is the true one which we actually, we have to actually, when we pray, so you can see that this is the goat there. Yeah, uh, the picture you can see, there's a goat. So this is a big celebration, the, the birthday of the Thai Pak Kong. So this is the true one which like we actually have to, to pray to the uh, Thai Pak Kong and tell, and it's like to, to wish him well, uh, wish him 
and then asking for the, the protection and, and uh, asking for protection from him and the blessings from him. Next. So this is the pictures which you are actually shown in the book. Yeah, these are all the fine details which we actually have. That was all these are actually done before our, our renovation. So because at that point of time, we were worried about the, the, the loss of the beauty because I mean, the, the building was getting deteriorated and we did not expect to actually uh, start the project so soon. But anyway, we managed to do it. Next. <coughs> so now we talked about the fine details of the temple. And these are just to show you the, uh, the fine workmanship of the temple. Yeah, and Clement Liang, Mr. Clement Liang, was helping me on this, uh, some of the, the details. He actually helped me to do some research on, the, on, on, the, on some of the, the details because, I mean, some of these building the, the parts actually with some stories, which I don't, didn't even know, but anyway, he find, managed to help us to do it. So uh, I have to thank him for that. Next. So this is a Southern Fujian architecture. Even though it's actually a Hakka temple, uh, Hakka control or, or mainly Hakka managed temple, but it's actually a Fujian architecture. I think that point of time, I think Fujian is still the main uh, dialect in, in, in Penang, and then there were many Hakkan <coughs> people from, from, from Fujian. So it's a three base, two veranda, two wing room. So you can see that these are the three wings just now. When we started, you remember, we were talking about 1865, we have extra. Then 1880s, we have the two wings. Then 1911, we have the veranda. So these three actually come together. It's actually through a, a period of nearly 100 years to, to back, get into this picture. Right, next. So these are all the parts. Yeah. So I think it's actually... Uh... Dato Liu, can I ask them to go back to the previous picture? Yes, please. Yeah. Uh, Lavina, yes. If, if you notice, uh, there are two temples on each side of this main temple. Right? This main temple is just basically one story and a, a bit more. But, uh, and with Fuqian. The other two are actually Khoisan uh, temples from, from the Kaiping area in China. And obviously, they are very, very Cantonese. So if you are in Guangzhou, you see architecture like this, and you know, in other parts of Guantung. But this street, uh, just for your information, you'll find three types of southern Chinese architecture. You see the, the uh, Fujian architecture, you see the Guantung architecture. And earlier, um, Dato Liu had mentioned that there was a there was a Hanjiang temple, which is a Teochew, you know. Or, Chuan Chiu la, Chuan Chiu temple, Chiu Chiao temple, uh, that has a very straight ridge, you know, across. It's not a sweeping ridge and it's not very tall, but it's somewhere in between. So, very interestingly, along one street, you'll see uh, the different chi Chinese architectural styles of southern China. Okay, I just wanted to add that in. Please continue. Yes, Professor. Please feel free to add on anytime you want because, I mean, I'm sure, or, or in fact, you should be the one actually explain this as well. I think the view, you, you know it better than me. Yeah, but anyway, we just continue. As and when you feel, please, please add on. Thank you. Next. Next. Yeah, so this is the, the, the roof. Yeah. Next. Yeah, so this is in front of the temple, the, the wall, the, the frontage. Yeah, the facade. So this is actually a Si Wang Ting, yeah, Si Wang Pavilion. <clears throat> so there is actually a story here, which I don't, uh, I think we don't actually want to go about. But anyway, it's actually indirectly. We have this Tai Pak Kong Temple carries secret anti Qing dynasty messages based on this one, because based on this Si Wang Ting. So indirectly, I think, but this is a thing. We are not sure whether at that point of time they were having this, because I mean, 1799 until now, so in between there was still the Fan Qing Fu Ming, I think Anti Qing was still there maybe. So we are, we are not quite sure as to why it was actually done there. But I mean, this story itself actually carries some Anti Qing uh, messages. Next. So this is the 1810, yeah? Tong Ying Xie Gong. 
So handle things for the court carefully in the same place, meaning that colleagues work together. Yeah. So this is like you actually the comradeship. The is actually for the five five Ungsuk, the Ungsuk five districts. Next. So this is 1865. So this is when they actually renovated. Yeah. One of the renovation was done in 1865. So a happy gentleman can help others with kindness or good deeds. Next. So these are all the things when previously, I think when they went on the procession, they have all this, but we, we don't use it now. It's only for show, for decoration now. We, we do not use it anymore. Next, yeah. So this is one of the things. So there might be some story there. So we haven't actually found out yet. Yeah. So I mean, throughout the temple, there are actually so many of these carvings and all these, <coughs> you know, these, these graphics, which I think we are still in the process of finding all because some of those stories we don't even know. Next. So so this is the one we actually have. So this one is <coughs> this is actually painted. Yeah, when we actually have this, I think this, yeah, we actually ask them to paint this one. It's actually talking about Buddhism, Taoism, and Confu Confucianism, the harmony between. Because previously, when they do not actually talk to each other, the Buddhism, Taoism, and Confucianism. So when this uh, de during this Hu Qi period, so they were actually talking and then they were actually in, in harmony. And so that is when they actually have this. So I think we, we put this back. Next. So this is the Restoration Memorial Monument. So this is what we actually have for 1865. So this itself is already can be seen. Their name, even the Zhang Jing, Zheng Jing Gui, the one of the, a few names, a few big names during that time, 1865, the, the Chinese captain and all this, uh, actually their names are actually in this. So we, we are doing this for the new one as well. For this 2020 renovation, we are also doing this. this there will be another monument coming up. For, for the new donations. Next. So these are all the things which we have in the, these are all the, the ancestors which actually contributed a lot to Penang. Hakka. So Chong Fazi, I think everybody knows. Yeah. The Professor Lawrence owns his house now. <laughs> then uh, Taiki Yun, he has a rod. Then Ng Tak Chi. So these are all the one. This Ng Tak Chi helped to actually build a hospital. So this one helped to build schools and this one uh, also doing the same thing. So they are actually helping in terms of education, in terms of charity, in terms of the human being. When even when there was during this one, I think in fact, he, during the first world war, he was actually when there was not enough uh, rice, so he was actually giving rice away. So doing charities. So these are all the respectable people, uh, Hakka ancestors. So next. So this is our Award, UNESCO Asia Pacific Awards for Cultural Heritage Conservation 2021. Awards of Merit. So next is our plaque. We are going to receive it uh, towards the end of this year. So this is the plaque. So we have the name of Mr. Tan Yaoi on top of this. And then Ms. Fu Yen Chao is my present chairman for the temple. So we were the one actually are doing the whole, whole project together. Next. So this is the chop of our Thai Park Kong to say that everybody is really to, to protection, giving safe and peace of mind for everybody. So Thai Park Kong, taking care of everybody. So, and that's the end. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> See, we all can clap for you. Uh, thank you very much, that's a view. Uh, there were a few questions, so I picked them up. If you don't mind, I just... Uh, please, please. please. Tackle them. A gentleman, Kim Wong, asked the question, what is the difference between Topek Kong or Thai Pak Kung and the Malay Dato Kramat? You know, I mean, feel free to uh, discuss it. What's the difference, you know? I think the Thai Pak Kung is actually for Chinese. Topek Kong is Chinese. But I think because we come to Penang or rather Malaya, so we have our Malay neighbors. So when this, I think indirectly, 
they are also like a deification of their, the Malay people. So we call them Dato, Nato Kong, Nato Kong. In, in Malaysia, we call them Nato okay. Kong. So I think it's actually more like a Malay deification of their local chiefs, just like our Thai Pak Kong. So Thai Pak Kong is for Chinese, then the Nato Kong is for Malay. But I think Malays themselves don't pray, but it's only Chinese. So it's like we are also praying the Malay uh, local chiefs as the treating them as God as well, the Nato Kong. Yeah. Okay. Kim. That, that's a good answer. That's a good answer. Uh, there's another question which is saying, is Tua Pek Kong three people? <laughs> These are always my own questions as well, actually. I always been faced with this question. In fact, we talk about Zhang Li as the Tua Pek Kong because Tua Pek Kong is Tua, means he, I, I presume that is the eldest. So when we have Tua Pek Kong, Ji Pek Kong, Sa Pek Kong, but I think overall they are being prayed together as one entity. So collectively, they are called Tua Pek Kong, I think. We do not treat them as such as, because when we go there, we do not say that we only pray Chang Li and we do not pray the other two. We pray the Sun Brothers together. So can, as you can see from the first picture, which we have the grave, yeah. Yeah, so the three tombstones are together. So we pray together. So I presume that when we say about Tua Pek Kong, it's always the Thai Pak Kong, we, we don't only mention about, specifically about Chang Li only. But of course, we treat him as the Tua Pek Kong because he is the eldest. I think that is what we actually claim. Yeah, but when we talk about Tua Pek Kong, it's always like one person then, but when you pray together in three, yes. Thank you very much. Um, any other questions? There is one more question in the chat, which asks, how do you do the fundraising from government, private sector, or residents of the local community? I didn't see that. <laughs> this is the most difficult part which we're actually facing. That's why until we completed the project, we still owe about uh, 700,000. Yeah, when we complete the project in 2019, end of 2019, we were still owing. So luckily our contractor was actually quite steady. He, he not actually uh, chases a lot for it. So he allows us some time to do it. So, but anyway, we have some of our committee members who actually loan us the money. So we are still owing to our committee members. So in terms of the government, we always write to them. So we invite the chief minister to come and see the project itself. We see how we actually work and then we show them all the plans which we have in order to do this thing. Because I mean, they can see from the very beginning, we show the government that we are actually doing it seriously. We are following the highest standard and then we have the what, heritage management plan. 4C, 4C. We have the heritage management, uh, heritage management plan. We have the dilapidation survey. We have all the planning and then all the, we have five or six books. Yeah, we, I call it books because they are like 50, 60 pages, 100 pages, that kind of thing. So to talk about the, 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 the repair need to be done, yeah, and then how is the work to be done, the, the process? So how is the, the technique which we are using? So we have the left side on it. It's actually saying that, oh, this is the weakness. So the right-hand side, how is the rectification work? Then this is what technique which we are using. So we have all these things we show to the government and we ask them, we invite them to come to our temple when we started the work and all this. So they actually were convinced that we are actually doing a good job. And then as and when we do it, they started with 200,000. So, but as and when we do it, they see that we're actually doing it and we did not have enough. So we go for a second time, another 200,000. So that is how we actually got it from government. Then on the private sectors as well, because I mean, we didn't believe in actually applying for the donation in the first place without actually doing some work. Yeah, because I heard about complaints that, oh, all these people are actually getting the fund, they said fundraising for building temple or restoration, whatever, whatever. But they never con con complete the job. So... Then we started the job. Then we asked people to come. We invite people to come and see from outside. Of course, they cannot enter into the, the building site. So, but from outside, they see, and then we show them pictures as to what is the progress. And they can see that all the China, Chinese people from China, there are Chinese artisans coming from China. So, and they see that our supplies, our works, are actually our, our materials are all imported from China. So, of course, the, the woods are not, the woods are from local but the, the towels and the rest are actually from China. So we have these things and then we show them. So only after we show all these things and when we started the process, the project itself, when we show people that our work is actually going on, then money coming in started to coming in. 
flowing after that. And the main event which she actually collected the 1.4 million was carried out after we completed the project. You see or not? So that is how we actually we so in, in the process we were actually very tough because we actually have to borrow money from, from our committee members. Yeah. So we have some supportive committee members. So that is how we actually started on. Yeah. Do I answer the question? Yeah, I think it's very encouraging. Then questions are popping up very quickly. So I think I have to run you through them a bit right. faster. Okay. The next right. one is Anna Yao is asking, how do you foresee the future of this cultural and religious worships in the coming 20 years? How old is the youngest member <laughs> in the committee? And how would you engage the younger generation? Which is a very valid question, right? Because uh, many of the temples and Kongsis in Penang are uh, all the trustees are very old, you know, and it's hereditary. And so they, if they don't pass it on to the young, how, how do you tackle the issue of sustainability? So maybe this is actually a very, very good question, you know, this asked by younger a, people. Huh? Yes, I think, yeah, this is a very valid question because I mean, all these questions actually is not only applied to my temple here. I think it applies to all the Chinese associations in Penang. I'm in quite a few other associations and then I think many of our, our participants here are also in this committee member, uh, are also in these associations, I think I can see, especially Fu Yen Chao. This is my president here. Yeah, my, my current chairman of the temple. Okay. <laughs> uh, this, this because, uh, yeah. so, because the other thing is that, you know, um, we're talking about sustainability yes. and yes. I, so, I want to lead into this question because yes, is this the end of it? I mean, is this after doing this restoration after getting this award? No, no. Right? This I is mean, only so the beginning. Mm. We only, this is actually on the hardware, on the physical project we have completed, but we are now venture into the non, the, the intangible part. So we are going into this part and then you can see just now, we can see the two wings of the temple. It was previously rented out to tenants, but now once we actually completed, we have these two uh, empty space. So we have started the project actually, we have actually asked the Penang Tour Guide Associations, they come to actually conduct their, their seminars in our temple. Because now we try to use it as the temple, we have the two sides. So one side, I'm going to, we are going to actually uh, organize it in a, a small store, souvenir store. And so it's like a cultural center, a small cultural center. We will put some photos, some pictures and some history or to make it like a landmark to, to like a cultural center for Thai Pak Kung uh, spirit. So this is what we're trying to, Thai Pak Kung culture. We try to have one side of this to, to build that thing. We will do some souvenirs, you do some of the, the, uh, the memorandum thing to actually in that building itself, some files or cups or whatever, the kind of thing, to, souvenirs to, to make people understand the, the culture of Thai Pak Kung. And then we also revive the Thai Pak Kung. We have the Bob Wei, we have the Tiu Chiam. So those are actually like the, uh, what do you call, prediction, the forecast, for, fortune telling thing. So we have that, they actually seek the, the blessings from the God. So they're also asking questions and all that thing. So we are going to revive that. Then on the other side of the temple, the second wing, so we are going to have a, a, a activity center. So we are going to link up with all the local associations, ask them to come and conduct seminars. We are going to build it and then we have a, like a conference room, we have a meeting room, we have the, we'll get the Wi-Fi, we have the projector ready so that they can actually rent the place. We ask for the school children to come and do the activities. We are going to employ people to do craftsmen, to do some crafts uh, uh, activities in the building itself. So we want them to actually come to UNESCO building and you are actually doing activities under a UNESCO, inside a UNESCO building. So with that itself, because I mean, even you get the UNESCO award, it's not everybody understands the UNESCO award, the, the, the prestige or the, the significance. So we want to actually educate, we want to have the awareness. So we're actually trying to partnering with all these different, uh, different associations as well as schools or even tour guides. We're actually asking tour guides to come and do it. And in fact, we are also extending our, our invitation to the Malay, the, the non-Chinese crowd as well. The tour guides, we actually ask them, you can actually invite all those Malays to come because we are also talking about the environment, the, the community. We talk about harmony in the Malaysia. 
because Chinese culture is one of it. We don't want it to be left out as if we're actually different. So this is the sustainability part. Yeah, Professor? Very, very good answer. How are we doing for time, Lavina? Um, we're going to be overrunning a bit, but maybe we can address the questions that are there. Okay, okay. Okay, so uh, maybe one or two last questions in the chat and then we'll just go through all of them. Yes. Okay, I mean, it's getting more and more, right? Yeah. <laughs> No, I mean, that's good, isn't it? I mean, please, please feel free to leave as and when you want. As long as the organizer is here, I think we can still continue for a bit. No, yeah? I, mean, I think, I think if we, we could, what we could do is if we run out of time, I think that you can give written answers to this, you know, and keep, ah. keep the spirit of it going. Uh, okay, I'm going to try and be a bit faster about it. There's a very nice comment by um, Mang Yin Hon, but it's, uh, I won't read it out. But there was a comment on the before and after pictures that show a major difference, right? Yes. Based on what reasons the fabrics at the altar and at the patio walls were replaced, removed, and other artifacts? Um, are you positioned to answer that? Say again. Okay. If you, you think back to the before and after pictures, right? Yes, yes. Especially they refer to the altar where the, 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 the fabric covering the front of the altar was changed or it looked right. very much newer. Why was it, I, obviously, why was it changed? You know, if you have a, a very precious fabric like that. And at the patio wall, that means in the inner wall, uh, the, the, the images were different, right? The before and after and several other artifacts. So because you said uh, Yao, Tan Yaoi was saying that they will revert back to the original. Yeah. Uh, maybe you can explain just these two things. You change right. the altar cloth. Yes. I think some of those actually changed because it did not actually follow the 1911, 1910 period. Some okay. of those actually came later. It was the, okay. the recent period. Only in the uh. 70s or 60s, then they came. So therefore, we actually take those out. We remove all those things because those were actually latest added. Uh, artifacts, so we did not want that, including the including the uh chai hoi, the the, the hand painted painting in the yes. courtyard. Yes, some of those are actually extra ones. So those are the one which I think which we believe were not during that period of nineteen ten. We take all out, and then in fact some of those artifacts we are still keeping, and then we are trying to use it. So when our cultural center will actually be set up, so those tui lian yeah will actually be and at the patio wall yeah the tui lian will actually be, be uh, put back again. We, we so have actually uh, restored yeah. some of those, the, the, the better value one we have restored. But those, the two new ones, we did not want already. Okay, okay. Thanks. The, the next one is about the lime mortar base use materials. I'll quickly answer this because yes, yes. Um, when the Chinese craftsmen came and over a long period of time, fascinatingly, the particular company that did the restoration uh, did most of the UNESCO award-winning uh, projects in Malaysia when it came to Chinese temples. Uh, that's, but that's not the point. In my questions to the main boss, I always ask, which, who has the best line in the world, right? And who produces the best lime? And he said, I've tried all the different limes in Malaysia from north to south. And I when I and compare it to the Chinese lime which I bring in from Tanzan, China, I still find mine the strongest and the hardest. So I have no choice, you know, but to bring it in in order to ensure there's longevity in the plaster. So it, so the answer to that, it has been important. And, but there's a very valid reason for that because in southern China, the, the lime is from what they call seashells. Whereas in Malaysia, they, they take it from rock in the limestone hills and the, the variation in lime composition from the hills obviously is uh, a lot greater as opposed to seashells, which are very consistent. But I think if you are a, a, an artisan who believes in things lasting for a lifetime, you would use the best. So really that's why it, it's not really locally sourced. It's not because they do not want to use local materials, but because of the quality of the materials itself in its natural form. 
Okay, so that answers that question on uh, resourcing locally. The next one is, uh, we get Kim Wong again, he's asking, uh, it looks like this is a temple and also clan houses for five districts of China, representing different surnames from the same province. Am I right? Okay. He no, is suggesting that it, this is not a clan house, right? No, it's five districts. In fact, they are only managing. It's not really okay. like we own it. We are only managing. Well, I mean, I think I think this is a very valid question because when you have the term so, right, very clearly stated, and although you try to explain that there were five the people from the five provinces, you know, and it wasn't a clan house like the Hokkien clan houses in Penang, right? Yep. Okay, next question. Everybody was actually thinking about a resource. Can you recommend a good reference book on local, local Chinese folk culture religion? <laughs> yeah, I, cannot. Uh, I, cannot. Uh, I, I mentioned, okay, I mean, this is a very interesting fact, right? Uh, spend a bit of time. This gentleman I call Ronnie Pinsler, right? He's actually Eastern European. Uh, he was a dealer in jewelry and diamonds, and he, his family came and they settled in Singapore, and eventually he moved to Penang. But what made him move to Penang was he is crazy about folk culture. And I've been with him on several trips. He was so famous in Penang among the folk temples. Uh, he would get a call at midnight and say, would you like to come down to the temple because we're having this fire ceremony? And pop, he leaves the house and goes down. And he's been doing this collecting for the last 15, 20 years. He brought out a book a long time ago, which is out of print. And he's supposed to do another one. I don't know whether he's got around to it, but he has the biggest collection, okay, of abandoned god statues. I mean, I don't know how to explain that. Because when they move a temple or they move an altar and they, they cannot accommodate the, the statues, they have to find a respectable place for it. And so, in fact, I designed his house for him and I had a, a double-layered library where he put all his different altars. But... He is the expert. So when I want to find out who is this God, and I go into a strange temple and I don't recognize the statue, I'll take a picture of it and send it to him. So if there's a book on Chinese folk culture in Penang, it would be a book written by him. I guess that what I can do is I'm going to find out is, have you written your book? <laughs> okay. Sorry, I'm, I'm speeding things up a bit. What is the species of timber used in the temple, uh, Dato' Lea? Oh, no, I, I, I'm, I'm not familiar. Okay. I actually have that, but I don't remember the name. Okay. I have it in my book. <laughs> the, 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 the book. Actually, I, just now I mentioned the book. So those yeah. things are actually in there, but I did not, I did not memorize it. Okay, somebody send, send your name to Dato' Lea. He'll give you a copy of the book. <laughs> but normally, we if it's a local, uh, it's, it's local, it's local, lo local, local species, it would be what we call chengal. So it's a grade one hardwood and about the best, strongest hardwood uh, that you can find. Very popular in the old days. The only problem today is that they cut the trees too young. So they have not matured enough. And so what they were valued for in the early days, uh, they don't perform as well. But it's basically, I would believe that you'll be Cheng uh, In some of the temples I've done, they use something called uh, Palau, right? Which is also a very strong wood. But primarily it's a hard wood. If it's from Malaysia, nowadays it could be a, it could be a mix of different woods. How come it's the God of Prosperity? Uh, how come the, the, the God of Prosperity? Uh, yeah. Yeah, just no, now the name it was there. The Cheng Lang was there, I think. Yes, okay. How come the God yeah. of Prosperity on the wall and courtyard is different before and after? That was the same question. Yes. Yeah, so why is it different uh, before It's the and same after? because, I mean, this is actually the, is done in the recent period. So we did not actually follow. So we just get the, the latest to just... Uh, okay. Do it. Is the restoration period considered long? I don't think so, lah. Huh? I think yeah, it's actually quite okay, I think, for us because I mean it's 32 months. Yeah, but all in all, it's actually five years because the planning, the process itself, yeah, the application and the approval itself will actually take some time. So the overall is actually five years. But I think 
for a temple of 100 years, I think five years is actually quite okay, right? <laughs> okay, there's, sure. another, there's another question. Would you recommend a good book on the different Southern Chinese temple styles? That's a slightly variation, right? Uh, I, not really, I, you know. No, the peop, the people, when they, they, they do books on Chinese architecture, if you're doing Hokkien architecture, they'll do it Hokkien. If they are doing Cantonese, they'll do Cantonese. I mean, that's what I found. But there is a book called uh, Encyclopedia Malaysia, and there's a book on architecture. And there are some sections, there are two sections on Chinese architecture, and they do a good comparison, but that book is also out of print. And I did, I did a version for them, an essay in it called Kung Fu Shui. So that is an encyclopedia book, Encyclopedia Malaysia on architecture, and you find some reference to the different styles of Southern Chinese temples, but in Malaysia. Because when, when the Chinese temples are brought out of the villages in China into Malaysia, they start to change the architectural style. So if you want to talk about whether it's in China or in Malaysia, there's a, there is a subtle difference, right? Okay. Uh, so how do you, I mean, why are you asking a question? This is a friend of mine. Over two decades since the restoration of Chong Fatsi mansion undertaken by Professor Lo, followed by other high quality restoration projects of Chinese good heritage in Penang, traditional artisans from China have been employed. <coughs> Wasn't there a process of transfer of knowledge and skills to local craftsmen from these Chinese artisans? What was the challenge in doing so? Uh, I think it's a very good question. We have tried, okay. In fact, I guess it happened at a time where very few people wanted to do hard labor. You know, it's really using your hands, working, and you have to be pretty strong to be able to be an artisan come worker in the building trade. So when we did try, we advertised, we thought about uh, transfer of technology, very few takers, right? And we were given a chance over a period of 30 years. Unfortunately, there's been very little success. And in fact, now, um, the artisans who, are, who started with, with me, really, in the first building in 19, 1993, that's how long ago it was. Uh, when they came, they were about 25, 30, right? So can you imagine they are almost 60, 60 years old and the last guy who you see painting on the, the period, he never had spectacles and now he has to wear spectacles in order to do the, the Chai Hoi and the Chien Nian, right? And in my last conversation with him before the pandemic, right, two, two and a half years ago, he says, well, after me, that's not going to be anybody else. So even in China, you're going to have problems, right? So that, does that answer your question, Sohadi? And the next one is, can you please share the recording of this session with us? I leave it to Lavina to do that. Yes, yeah. we will upload it on the Hong Kong Icon YouTube page. So keep, 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 uh, keep tuned, stay tuned. <laughs> yes, okay. Then uh, I think Dato Liu has answered this. Have you set aside funds or repairs? Repairs for wear and tear. I think after he's paid for the original uh, restoration work, he'll have to start getting his repair fund, I'm sure. And that is an ongoing process. And it will all, he'll never get to the end. I promise him that. <laughs> <laughs> how, how will you please share how the period of historical reference set for temple conservation project? Must it always go back to the year of origin where possible? Uh, maybe you have to answer this. I mean, given your experience, I know it's a, it's a it may be a difficult question, but that will be out because I think it's you will have to make that decision at some later date if you are asked to be a restoration chairman of another temple. So, how do you decide which period to restore it back to? We decide on, I think we were actually checking on the material which we have, the knowledge, yeah, because earlier than that, we might not have anything to actually show us. We did not have that kind of knowledge. Yeah, and, and uh, the pictures were not enough. The earliest picture which we can get was around that period. So okay. I think that were, we were trying to... So I think if you want to go beyond that, like our temple the, near the Tanjung Pekong one, if you talk about 200 years old, we did not believe that it was actually as such. 
So there must be a period when we actually have to set and then, okay, like this one, we know that it started in 1810, but we couldn't get any, any literature on this 1810 uh, period, the, the style of architecture, whatever, we could not get. So I think that's the best we can get. It was until around 1900, that was the time, the time even 18, 18, end of 18 something. But I think we had the restoration the, the, at that point of time, the major restoration was done in 1911 and 12. Therefore, we actually follow that. So well, that I think you, our own decision, yeah. we don't really have a guideline. Well, I think you were very well guided by the conservation architect. And that's why, you know, Hong Kong icon is very essential for Hong Kong, right? <laughs> The professional pro culture profession has to be there to advise. And it's actually quite an easy question to answer. If you go back to the Venice Charter, somewhere in it, it says, nothing should be conjecture, right? So if you are unsure of which period the building is, like, I mean, okay, that was, that was saying, I don't know what it looked like earlier, right? Then you just do nothing and just keep it as it is or return it to what you think is that period, right? And I think in conservation practice, that is very, very clear, right? Uh, no conjecture, right? Don't speculate, don't, don't imagine that I think it looked like that, no, right? Just leave it alone and accept the layers of history. I would say that that's a, that would be a fair and simple answer to that. Um, I think there's one more question. Or oh, an observation is being made here. I believe the well was in the temple compound for feng shui reasons. The original one is near the sea. So this well could represent the sea? Uh, oh. No. <laughs> no. It was okay. more for the practical purposes. Previously, I think the, the well was used. Okay. Yeah, it was for the usage to, to, to keep the water. I think they are using the water from the well. Mm -hmm. yeah? That point of time, we did not have tap water, I think. So that was the actual usage. But after that, I think it was not used. That's why it was actually buried and then it was actually covered. Okay, um, I brought you all right to the end. Okay. We've gone past 47 minutes, I think. Uh, that's quite a good achievement for Hong Kong Icon. And maybe I'll, I'll hand the, the session over to Lavina to have the final say in the words. Thank yes. you very much, Dr. Leo. Thank you so, so much, Dr. Leo and Lawrence for the sharing. I think it's been probably one of the most interactive sessions we've had at Hong Kong Icon. So I think there's definitely a lot for us to learn from this project. And it's also brought a nice mix in the audience of, um, you know, professionals and budding, budding professionals or those with just interest in heritage conservation. So also thank you for spreading the outreach of uh, the, the projects as such in heritage conservation to a larger audience. For those who are with us this evening, thank you for your patience. Thank you for staying a little bit longer. If you have any more questions for, uh, for Dr. Leo or for Lawrence, you can email them to the Hong Kong Icon admin account and we'll pass them over and hopefully you will get uh, all your answers really soon. So thank you so, so much for your time and uh, I'll end it over there. Thank, thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks. Good night. Bye to everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye.